Let us bow our heads just a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we certainly deem this a privilege to be here today in this city of Los Angeles and amongst these, the believers that the elected has been called out of the world, separated children of God in this great hour that we're living under this great expectation of the appearing of our lover, the Lord Jesus, at any time. We thank Thee for this in our heart, that we believe that He will come in our generation. We're looking for Him today. If He isn't here today and we're here tomorrow, we'll be looking for Him tomorrow. Dear God, we pray that this meeting will be just a, a special meeting. May it be a time that it'll make a, a record for the church's advancement that'll be on your books in the eternity. Bless every feeble effort that we put forth, Father. We realize that we're a total failure without you, so therefore we must have you, Lord, if it can, we continue. And we do not want this for our own glory. We want this for your glory. For that's our heart's desire, is to see Jesus glorified in his people. To strengthen the faith of those, Lord, in this day when the battle is so hard, we come in for this revival among us and a retreat, a refreshment. We pray that you'll grant all these things to us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Brother Shakarian, Sister Wyatt, and to the friends of our Lord Jesus Christ, I certainly appreciate of this opportunity to be in Los Angeles again to preach of this glorious Jesus that we're all out here to learn more about today. If our efforts are... This, kind. <laughs> this is quite a complicated affair, say. This thing doesn't like to cooperate. Well, it is going to work like that. That sounds a little better. I'm kind of small, got a small voice, and, but a great big message from the Lord. <laughs> a lot of opposition from Satan to keep from bringing it. We'll get here anyhow. We're trusting this will be a great week for all of us. I was sitting there thinking of how many times that the, our dear deceased brother, Thomas Wyatt, no doubt, has spoke from this same pulpit, a great servant to Christ. I knew Brother Wyatt. He was always a great inspiration to me when I would meet him and talk with him. I remember just as a boy preacher, he would always, his book called Wings of Healing, I like that title, Wings of Healing. And we're glad to be here in this temple that's been dedicated for the service of Christ. God bless his widow and all you people who, sure, I know you miss him too. I missed his program when I heard that he was gone. I like to hear that voice. He was getting a little aged, but he still carried a good, strong voice and, a, and a, had a message from God. And his life still lives on here in you people. And over in the mission fields where he sent all of those units and so forth, the gospel still moves on because of Thomas Wyatt. May his soul rest in peace until the time we meet him in that glorious land where there is no death or old age. We're here to carry on now until our time is called or the great general resurrection when Jesus comes to get us all. Now, I know you have service here, I think, tonight. And I was told a few moments ago that, I, that you had service here tonight, so I, I will hurry up as quick as possible because I've got Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, so forth this week. So I'm trusting that the Lord will bless us. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to preach Christ, if he will, if it be his will, and all the power of his resurrection that he will permit us to do. Whatever he gives us to do that we want to do with all our heart. And I'm, I know that he'll bless us if we'll just believe him. And now, just before we open the word as to read it, I want to speak to him again while we bow our heads and get quiet now, trusting the confusion is over. 
We realize, all Christians know, that the enemy, our enemy, works on every hand. But, see, when things like that happen, this whole quiet. God knows what it's all about. See, just sit still. He might have been doing something you might not know nothing about right now. Let's speak to him. Father, we pray now that you'll calm the sea. The mighty Lord Jesus come walking in on his word now. Introducing it to us in the new spheres and his power and manifestations. We ask this as we read his word. May it be quickened to our hearts today that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now if you'll turn to the book of Deuteronomy. I want to read a verse or two out of the book of Deuteronomy. The 16th chapter of Deuteronomy. Observe the month of Abbot, which means April. And keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abbot, the Lord thy God brought thee out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover of the Lord thy God, of the flocks and of the herds, in the place where the Lord shall place, in, pardon me, in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name therein. Thou shalt not eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therein. And the bread of affliction, for thou comest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste. Thou mayest remember the day that thou comest out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. And there shall be no eleven bread seen in thee all the coast, all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there be any flesh which thou sacrifice the first day at the evening remain at all until morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any gate which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. There thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at evening and the going down of the sun at the season that thou comest forth out of Egypt. It's like we got some trouble again. I believe I can holler louder than that. <laughs> it's a very strange text. I wish to speak a little while on this afternoon. It's on God's provided place of worship. Now, this is unusual. But as I've said many times before, that God uh, usually dwells in unusual manners, unusual places, does unusual things, because he is unusual. However, who believes on him acts unusual. There's many, many things that we'd like to say about his unusualness, but I know that all who are acquainted with him knows that he is unusual does the unusual things some sometimes at the unusual time so we are trusting today that god will bless these this reading of the word and the text that i've chosen to talk to you about now what i think that caused our trouble here was they cut them tape recorders in over there and just pull the current right out of the microphone so they don't fix it while well, you hear me anyhow. God will fix our ears so that we can hear. <laughs> the reason I want to speak on this text, and it's a good time to do it at the full gospel businessman's meeting, is because all of the churches, or many of them, are represented in this group. All different denominations. I find many times that People meeting them on the street, in the highways, on planes, trains, buses. I'll say to them, are you a Christian? One of them will say, well, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Lutheran, Pentecostal, or something on that manner. Everyone has got a denomination that he wishes to represent. 
And that's perfectly all right to be represented by a denomination. But uh, still the bad part of it, that each one thinks that this certain group is the only group that, that's going to go to heaven. And it's the only one that, that God is represented in at all is somebody's certain group. I thought this afternoon would be a good time to settle that. <laughs> and perhaps that's why Satan keeps working on this microphone. <laughs> you know, anything that man makes will go wrong, but what God makes doesn't go wrong. <laughs> so, uh, being a good time to do it, a good place to do it, so God help us that by His grace we will try to do our best to talk about it. Now, this text coming out of the book of Deuteronomy, I understand that Deuteronomy, as I have some scriptures and things written down here, it used to be I could think of them real fast. But since I passed 25 the second time, <laughs> it comes a little hard for me to remember it all. So I go into the room and pray, and as he gives me the scriptures, I jot them down and maybe a note now and then with it. Kind of keep my mind running the way it was when he gave it to me. Deuteronomy being a Greek word meaning two laws. The word Deuteronomy. And God has two laws. And one of them is a law of death to disobedience, to his word. We find that when Eve disobeyed his word, it brought death. That's one of his laws. The day you eat thereof, that day you die. And then he has another law, which is a law of life to obedience. If you don't do such and things, why, keeping his word, you'll live. Boils down to two things, to my way of thinking, that's either keeping his word or disobeying his word. One of these laws was given at Mount Sinai, and the other was, that's the law of death. The other law was given at Mount Calvary, where the law of life was given through Christ Jesus. He also has two covenants. He had a covenant with Adam, the first man on earth. And that covenant was on conditions. If you do so and so, I'll do so and so. Adam would had something to do in order to keep this covenant alive before God. He had to walk in God's ways, keeping all of his word, not breaking one word. But then he made another covenant. That was with Abraham. This covenant was not on conditions, but was unconditionally. God gave the covenant to Abraham, no strings tied to it at all, unconditional. Not I will, I have. I've already done it. And that's the law that Christians must live by. It's not what we do ourselves, but what he has done for us. Christ has already been sacrificed. Now, he will be. He has been. It's a finished product. He lived, died, rose again, ascended into heaven, and has come back in the form of the Holy Ghost. So it's, it's a finished work with God. Christ, knowing no sin, became my sin, that I might stand in his place. He took my place. I was in him at Calvary when he died. There I must die with him to live. Because the law of sin and death is in the body, you have to die to be reconciled to him. But now we get all these words that we could use, these great texts, which are, we're all familiar with many of them, and the great types of the scripture. But this afternoon we're confronted with this, that... In the face of all this, he still says there's only one place that he'll meet you. In the face of all of our different theories, we've had Judaism, we've had Mohammedism, we've had 
we got all kinds of creeds and denominations, churches and so forth, but yet God said there's just one place that he'll meet you. All those places. Each one says that he meets in my church. If you don't belong to my church, uh, he, he won't meet you. You've just got to be in this group or he, or he just won't meet you there. Or he won't meet you nowhere else but there, rather. And then we find out here that he does have one place. Just one place only. That I shall sacrifice the sacrifice in the place that the Lord thy God shall choose. Now, he's got a chosen place that he meets the worshiping children. And they were not to sacrifice anywhere else but in that one place. Any other place would not work. He had one certain place that he would meet them. And one place alone is where he meets the worshiper. Then if that be true, we better be very careful that we find that place. I think it's very behooving to us that as people who know that we're dying and living in a dying race, living in a dying age, living in a dying nation, under the banner of death, and this world must soon come to an end. It can't go much longer. Sin is too deep. It's beyond hope. There's no more hope for the world. It's past that. I believe the Holy Spirit is gleaning in the fields, finding this and that. And for the hour is far spent. The gospel has been preached to every nation. Isms and things have followed it. But yet the gospel has went on just the same. And now at the end time, we see the things happening the way they are. There's a great warning amongst the elected people of God to find what is right. And it behooves us to know that, not out of somebody's theory, but to know what is truth. What the Bible says is the truth. Because it'll be too late one of these days for us. And this may be the day. So let's take real consideration of what God has said. Remember, when God speaks a word, he can never take it back. He has to ever remain the same. He can never say something and say, well, I, I didn't exactly mean that. See, he's infinite. He knows the best to begin with. We say things that we think is best, then after a while we take it back. But God can't do that. And remain God. So if he's infinite, he, he does not do that because he's perfect in every word. He never utters a word unless it's eternal. All of his eternals that's with him at the beginning, his thoughts, his attributes. And they're only expressing themselves in the world today. Now, remember he has a provided place, one place alone where he'll meet the believing children. Anywhere else won't work. Remember, Jesus said when he was here on earth talking to a bunch of people who was very religious, very fine, very cultured, a very a zealous people of God. But Jesus said to him, in vain you worship me, teaching for doctrine the traditions of man. Remember how pious those people was and how zealous of God. I believe if we were counting... The people who were more zealous of today or that day, they'd be more zealous than we are. Far more. When it comes to keeping traditions and laws and things, they live by those. And they were very zealous of God and they believed God. But Jesus, God made flesh among us, said, in vain do you worship me. Now, he didn't say they didn't worship him. They was worshiping him, but in vain. So anything in vain is of not a, no avail. It doesn't do no good. You should never do it because you're just wasting your time. You're wasting your breath. You're wasting your efforts until we come to know what we're doing. Surely if God expects people to be perfect, as Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. There must be some preparation somewhere. And he said, I'll choose a place that the people will worship me, 
No other place will I meet him. And now uh, that's got to be that place, and we are to seek it out. Find out where it's at, and then go there. I think we should turn there quickly when we find the place, leaving other things alone. I remember Jesus said in this same scripture here that I'm quoting, Man's tradition then is in vain. We should never fool with him. There needs be somewhere, someplace, that he has provided a place for us that we could come and our, the worship would be received. Now remember, outside of that chosen place, no matter how sincere you are, how fundamental you are, you're still worshiping in me. I know that sounds rude, but the building's about finished. We don't want it shaking. Let's bolt it down with the gospel so that when people meet you on the street or wherever you are, you Christians, that you'll have an answer for them. In the hour when they're saying, oh, this is that, and I've seen these do this and that, do that. Certainly all these things have got to happen, but there is a place that's provided by God alone. And that's the place where God meets the worshiper alone. Notice the second verse. Worship in the place that I have chosen. Chosen what? In this place shows that he has a place where all people worship. Other places are in vain. And in this same place, he said, I have chosen also to put my name in this place. I'll choose a place and I'll put my name in it. And this place that he's going to worship. This shows that there's one place, just one. It must be God's choosing. It can't be ours. We have no choice coming. He's already chosen. Now what God chooses is right. I can choose wrong. You can choose wrong. But God cannot choose right. After all, it's He's the one that's being worshipped. And He's got the place where He wants His worshippers to meet there. And we must meet Him there. That's the only place that he stays, only place that he'll hear you from. Let us notice here also, the place I've chosen to worship me in, I'll put my name in that place. Oh, now let us search the scriptures for that place that he has his name in. Now, we have shadows and types all through the Bible. We know that, that different places is where he met. The people, but that's not the place that he would meet them today because they were only foreshadowing something coming up to the real place where he is to meet the people. The place, the church that he is to meet in. And there is a place, there is a church that God promised to meet the people in this place and answer their prayers if they would just come to this place and worship him. Now, we find out that there's many claim and that they have the place. God's name is in their place. But you see, they put God's name in there. There's a lot of difference between God putting his name there and somebody putting their, his name there. We must remember that God said he would put, I have put my name. I will put my name in this place. That's the place that I choose and have chosen that people should worship. This bringing us now in view of these shadows of time brings us Christ in view. All the Old Testament foreshadowed Jesus. In Egypt that night, when there was to be a, a Passover, lamb killed for the protection of the people, we realized that God had one place, one condition. No matter how young, how old, a priest, a clergyman, whatever you was, you must be in this certain place. All outside that place perished. You must be in this one place, a place that he provided. Now we could stand much time this afternoon in explaining that which would be just reviewing what we already know, that how Christ foreshadowed in the types, the sacrificial lamb, how it must be kept up a male without blemish, and how it must be killed by the elders and 
how that the blood must be sprinkled on the door, all foreshadowing the coming of Christ. And under this shed blood was the place that God met the worshiper when the death angel passed through the land. I believe that we're ready to go out of Egypt one of these days, go into this promised land. And it's time that we got in the right place and quit this year fussing around. I'm Presbyterian, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist, I'm this, I'm that, or the other. Get out of it and find where this place is because there's death everywhere besides his chosen place. Death will strike us as sure as the world if we're not in his chosen place. But where he chooses, death cannot come. If you notice in the sacrificial land, Death had already visited there. Death had come to this place because the lamb had died. Death had already visited. And so where death had visited, then God promised that would be his place. That in view, we see now what the sacrificial lamb was, what the place of life was at that time. Now, to me, this denounces all arguments with Christ being in view, being the sacrificial lamb, then that denounces all denominations, all creeds, all dogmas, all church entity. It denounces the whole thing. That's right. For we find here, him in view, for he is the pure, unadulterated word of God. St. John 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Therefore, He is God's unadulterated Word, made flesh, made manifest. And this in view, we could not attach that to any church in the world today, any denomination. Any place like that, we could not attach it because it isn't so. We put Christ's name upon a building, call it the churches of Christ and this, there, that. That doesn't make it so. That doesn't do it at all. But when God puts his name in something, that's what does it. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that would type our modern organizations except Babylon. That's the only type in the Bible of our modern organization, organized religion, because it was founded by Nimrod and a forced unity amongst religious people. And that's what the creeds and our denominations do today, force unity. You either belong to this or you're out. And we're coming now, as we can see, to a forcing all into one great unity of it. But that is a mechanical made advice by man, and it cannot stand. It is not God's will. It is not God's program. No matter how people try to say it is, it is not. It can't be. It's just impossible for it to be. God wouldn't put his name in such a thing as that that denies his word. How can God live in something that denies his own word? You cannot do that. So... We find out it doesn't attach to any church, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, whatever it may be. It's not God's place of worship yet. Amen. Now let God who made this promise come forth and prove it that it's right. That's the way to do it. If he's still God, he's still God. If he ever was God, he remains God. And now... We see this forced religion right in view now to bring all the little groups into one great unity, they call it. Some of them believe in this and some believe in that and some deny this and some deny that. The Bible said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? It'll never work. We've got to be in an agreement. And what in agreement with what? Not in agreement with one another as much as we've got to be in agreement with the Word, with God. That's what it's got to be in the agreement with. Now we find out that a forced unity was represented by groups of people at Babylon. God cannot put his name in such a thing as that. He never did and he never will. 
Though they tried it, they put their name into it, put his name into it, but it's not so. But we must find where he put his name, for it is the place and the only place that he has provided for the Christians to come, uh, believing children, and worship him in this place. What would this place be? Now, to back it up, we could take the entire Bible to back up what I'm going to say. For the place that he chose is in Christ, in Jesus Christ. It is in him, his son, God's son, Jesus Christ. Well, you said, I thought the scripture reads here that he said he would choose the place and he would also put his name in that place. Well, the son always takes the father's name. My name's Branham because my father was Branham. And Jesus said that he came in his father's name. St. John 5, 43. I come in my father's name and you receive me not. Therefore, there's where God placed his name under the sacrifice of his own son. That's God's only provided place. There is where people can meet. God is in Christ. That is his provided place. No denomination, no creed, no nothing else. God's promised to meet only in Jesus will he meet. For that's the only place his name is. We also hear Jesus as the follow the scripture out in John, uh, John the 5th chapter and 43rd verse. He said, another will come and come in his name and him you will receive. We can join a creed, another, we can join a denomination. You'll receive him, but when you receive Jesus, it's different. Another will come. I'll say, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist, I'm Presbyterian. You'll receive that, all right. But I come in my Father's name, doing that what the Father said I would do, and you receive me now. He said, John came, and he had a great witness. But I have a greater witness in God, uh, in God than what John did. For what the Father has given me to do, that I do. The words that was written of him, what he must be in that day, for he was, his name was God. God has many titles. God's a title itself. He's called Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rephi, Jehovah Manassas. He's called the Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, Morning Star, Alpha, Omega, Beginning, and End of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All these titles, but his name, God's name is Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. That is his name. He had many titles, but one name. Only not another name under heaven given among man, whereby you must be saved. We find that that's true. Also this warning, that when this other one comes, that he come in his own name, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, so forth, you'll receive him. You'll join up with him, but Christ is turned down. They turn that down. The prophet said, let's check his name a little bit. The prophet said um, his name would be called Emmanuel. Now, Isaiah said that about the seventh chapter. And also in Matthew 1, 23, said this was all done that might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying his name shall be called Emmanuel, which is by interpretation, God with us. Emmanuel, and his name was Jesus. God with us, with his Father's name. He came in his Father's name. Therefore, God placed his name in his Son. That's the only place that you can worship him. The only place God will ever meet you is in that Son, which was typed by the sacrificial lamb. And all down through the Old Testament, all brought types of that one thing. That that place alone, God alone met under the sacrificial blood. Only place he met, the only places he meets today is not in the name of creed or the name of denomination, name of a church, a name of a group, a name of a society, but in the name of Jesus Christ. I tested that when I was a young man. I'd often heard of spiritualism, of the devil, how he does things. And I know if there was a God, there must be a devil. Because the Bible said there was a devil. And he, I thought, I heard about these spiritualists. I went to some of them and found out they were frawnies. Nothing to it. Just a big bunch of make-believe. But I found out there were some of them were real spiritualists. I was at a camp one time where a minister and I went. 
to see them in there. They raised the table up on the floor and had whiskey glasses sitting over it. And take that table, turn it back and forth, and get tire flying through the building. People's clothes. They had this up in the room. Said, this medium said, I'll challenge anybody to knock it down. Two men said, I'll get it down. They grabbed it around the legs like that and tried to hold it. While well, that table threw them plumb across the floor. Don't you just sit around. If you've never been a missionary, been on fields, all the thing you know is just a thought of a devil. If you look out here and some of these people walk around the streets, you can see him. But there is a devil. Amen. Certainly is. And people worship the devil don't even know what they're doing. They worship the devil in churches. Teaching for doctrine, the commandments of man. Creeds, creeds and traditions. And I said, this woman hollered over to me and said, they tell me you're a preacher. I said, I am. She said, then, if you don't, I said, what do you think about this? I said, it's the devil. And she said, well, then, if you've got so much power... Knock it down. I said, I don't have any power at all. I have no power. But I'm here representing one. Uh -huh. Glory to God. I said, Lord Jesus, you said in St. Mark, the 16th chapter, in my name they shall cast out devils. I said, now that your servant may know as the battle lays before me, I said, I command that table to fall down in the name of the Holy Church. It stayed right there. I said, I command that table to fall down there in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It stayed right there. I said, I command that table to fall down in the name of Jesus Christ like they broke all four legs off hitting the floor. In my name they shall cast out devils. That's the name of the Father. He put his name in Jesus Christ. And in him, he meets to worship. In him, he meets to cast out devils. In him, he meets to heal the sick. In him, he meets to save. In him, he meets to fill with the Holy Ghost. That's God's only place to meet people for worship. Now, we find out that Jesus said also that the word name Jesus means Jehovah's Savior. Jehovah the Savior. Remember, you shall not worship the Lord. Five, verse 5. You shall not worship the Lord in any gates that the Lord God giveth thee. Any gates. You shall not worship him there, God said in the fifth verse here of Deuteronomy 16. Thou shalt not worship him in any gates that the Lord God giveth thee. He give you these things for temptations. We're going to get into that this week, the Lord willing. See whether God takes his word back or not. Notice. He give you them gates, but don't worship the Lord in any of those gates because the Lord thy God ain't going to meet you there. But the Lord God has chosen the gate. He's chosen the door. Jesus said in St. John the 10th chapter, I am the door to the sheepfold. Yes, I am that door. He's Jehovah Savior. Now, we could go on here for hours explaining that, but I'm sure you understand it by your action. That you, you respond to the truth and to the word. So we'll not go any further. You can take it anywhere you wish you. Everywhere you come, if it's the truth, it'll fall right back in line with the rest of the word. You can't make the Bible say one thing one place and something else another. It's contrary to what he said first. It must be the same all the time. I'm omitting a lot of scripture here on this just because I see it's getting late. Our sister and them's having service here tonight. And we want to pray for the sick. It is to find out, Billy, if you got some prayer cards. No service. Good. Well, uh, but good. All right. Now let's find it. All right. We trust that the Lord will bless this lady for this. Let us have this place, giving us this time. There's so many infallible proofs that Jesus is the place. He's the gate. He's the name and the only provided way that God has for man to meet and worship. He is the way, the truth, the light, the gate, the door, the Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the ending, the rose of Sharon, the lily, the valley, the morning star, the Alpha, Omega, he's all the whole thing put together. He's both Ruth and offspring of David, the bright morning star. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, where we in there are sons and daughters to God in God's Godhead. Yes, his sons and daughters were in the family, if you're in there. Now, how do we get into this great place to worship? That's the next question. How do we get into this place if Jesus 
is the place. He's the name of God. He's the place of God's worship. And he's the only door to the sheepfold. And we want to find out how we get into him then. Now, if you're into the door, of course, you come in like the families. We was talking the other day about the, or at the breakfast about the little sheep that God would not close the door until he found that last little sheep and brought him in. If you come in, then you become a family. You're a family of God when you come into God, but you can't be a family of God and be Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, and Pentecostal. You can't do it. You have to come into Jesus Christ. Well, you say we did it. Well, see if you did it. Let's find out what the Bible says now. We find in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the Bible said, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. We're baptized into the body of Christ by one Holy Spirit. We're not shook in. We're not joined in. We're not baptized with water in. We are baptized with the Holy Ghost into the body of Jesus Christ. How long does it last when you get in there? Until you misbehave yourself? Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of your redemption. Hallelujah. Argue with him, not me. That's what it says. I'm reading it. All right, you're sealed until the day of your redemption. Until the day that Jesus comes for you. Then, think of it. You are then not yourself. You are a new creature. Or the Greek there means a new creation. You've been recreated again. The power of God comes upon you and you become created a new creature which brings a whole physical being, spiritual being, and everything in subject to the Word of God. Hallelujah. Not no other way. How can you say that you're a Christian and disobey His Word in one thing? Whosoever disobeyed the law in one, one part of it was guilty of all of it. Whosoever, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not just part of the words, every word. That he said in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, Whosoever shall take one word out of this book or add one word to it, his, his part will be taken out of the book of life. We are not to take away from the Bible or add to it. Just say what it says. And in 1 Corinthians 12, it said, By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Now, after you're in this body, Romans 8, 1 said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's a place where there's no condemnation. Whether you go to a Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian church, wherever it is, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature, and there's no condemnation in you, nowhere at all. That's God's meeting place. That's where God meets the worshiper. There's where you are, are counted a new creature. For they're dead to the things of the world. They're alive in Him. The living presence of God is with them day by day. He lives in them through every age. Every age it's come along down through the Bible when man meet God's requirement comes into the place to where He provided in His written word for that day. God Makes that person to be a new creature. And he has no condemnation. Look at Job. Am I deafening you away? I'm, at least Mike, I'm sorry about it. I know it's the rebound in here. I hear it here myself. But look, Job, regardless of how many people try to condemn him, how many said he was wrong, he was keeping the commandment of God by that burnt offering. He knew he was justified because he was keeping the commandments of God. That's how he was justified, because he was doing the things that God wanted him to do. The living presence of God lights up the day every day, from death of creeds and to life and to the word of the day. Now, God has things that he does as a, a little flower, like I said the other morning to breakfast. When a seed comes to life, it starts growing. It drinks from God's fountain, keeps pushing up till it gets to the bud part. Gets up into the flower, up into the blossom. Now we find out that when we start with Christ, we grow the same way because we grow in grace and in abomination of God. 
God's only provided plan for any age is his word. His son came and manifested every promise that was promised for his age. All the prophets came just exactly on time. They was God's word living on earth. They was the word. Jesus said that they were gods. Jesus called those prophets gods. A man met me in last meeting I had. He said, you're a poor theologian. And I said, I don't claim to be one. I said, the word don't come to a theologian. <laughs> Theology does. The word comes. <laughs> I said, just theology comes to a theologian. But I said, but we're talking about something else. Now, we find that in each age when God said a certain thing would happen, here come that man along and manifested that. Here come that people along and lived that. That was God himself living in the people because it was the answering of his word. Now, God's only provided way and only provided plan today is His Son through His Word for this age. Quickened by the Spirit of His life. Quickened. Now, we have great schools of theology. And many times when we do that, nothing against it. Certainly not. But you see, when you've got a school of theology, Jesus said in St. John 4, the time is coming and now is when God, being a spirit, will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Now, some people have spirit, no truth. Others have truth, no spirit. So it's just like if we had a big car, we were going somewhere in a Cadillac, and both Cadillacs is made just alike. And we push them out here, and we out to the tanks, and we fill them both up with gasoline. And you crank and crank on one. Well, you look out and say, well, the seat's all right, steering wheel's pretty, it's got diamond studs in it, and plush sit, sets pretty. I can sit back and go to sleep. And all, a lot of things you could do, each one. But you see, one of them, all of them has the right mechanics, but one of them has the dynamics. You see, you might know the mechanics, but it takes the dynamics to start off the mechanics and make them work. And that's what's the matter at the church today. We're full of theology without any dynamics in it. That's right. See, in other words, you've got to have the spark to the gasoline, or the gasoline's no more than, it's not even as good as water, as long as it hasn't got the spark to fire it. So that's why no matter how well we're taught, how well we believe, and how much of the Bible that we say is true, and we believe it all true, it's got to be the, the dynamics has got to be there, the spark to set that word afire to make it start rolling. It's got to have that. If you don't, the church sets still. The car sets still. You'll set still. But no matter how much you say, I sympathize, I believe every word of that, you've got to have something to spark that off to make that 100 octane go to fire and the big church of God go to moving on. It's got to take the dynamics with the mechanics. Nothing wrong with the mechanics, but lacking dynamics. And I think that's what's the matter with the church today. We're lacking that dynamical power to press this word and make it live for this day. Martin Luther had the mechanics and dynamics of his day. John Wesley had them of his day. Pentecostal had them of their day. What about our day? It's another time. The church should be fully grown now, ready to go meet Christ with the manifestation of every blessing that he promised in the Bible, operating in that one great body where he promised that he'd meet the people and be worshipped in this great uh, church of his. But you see, we send our kids away to school. We learn reading, writing, arithmetic, all the history of the prophets and everything. That's all right. But unless you've got something behind that, Oh, you say, well, I, I shouted, I spoke with tongues. That's good. I believe that too. But that's not what I'm talking about yet. See, it'll, it'll, it'll splutter. You say, pank, pank, boom, boom, like an old car trying to start. You say, yeah, I believe this. I believe that too. But, but when it comes to this, them days, oh, no, no. She's a hundred octane brother with the right kind of a generator behind her. It'll fire every word of God to its promise. Right? That's what's the matter with us today. We almost come to a stop. We want to believe this, believe that. I say something about this. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, the Bible said so. That settles it. If God said so, it's there to be done. If, we, if that's what God said do, we've got to do that. Just stay there until God fires it off and directly you start running then again, you see. If you don't, you get the plugs all smutted up. <laughs> so we need a, a, something different. We need something to fire us off. And notice, not only does he come in by the Holy Spirit... With the learning of his word, he manifests that word. Now remember, the prophets believe the word. They receive the word of God. And God 
the Holy Spirit came into them and fired that promise out and made it come to pass. Oh, my. Who's going to condemn that? Jesus said, who can condemn me of sin? Sin is unbelief. Whatever God wrote, whatever the prophet said, I'm the answer. What they said, I do, I do. He came as a prophet, the Son of Man. That's exactly what he was and what he proved to be. He was. Why? The dynamics is there to fire off the mechanics. He was the mechanics, the Son himself, and the Father was the dynamics. It's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He splatters forth the, the, the dynamics and makes the thing move on. He brings it to pass. When did I ever say anything like Samuel said one time to the people? Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? See? When did I ever say it? When did it not happen to come to pass? Oh, you, what you told us come to pass, but we want the king anyhow. That's what it is today. People want to hold on to their petty ideas. They want to hold on to their creeds. They want to hold on to this. And I'm talking about a revival in our day. How can we have a revival when it's all messed up the way it is? Water, gasoline, and everything else in it. All kinds of detergents and all these modernistic things mixed into it. I was coming down the road one day, and it said... Some kind of modern detergent said, uh, you don't have to wash the dishes. The only thing you have to do is dip them in there and dip them out. I thought I'm going to be a hero in my house. I go and get me a box of this stuff. And I said to the wife, go on in, honey. Let me wash the dishes. I thought, boy, them guys know what they're talking about, them scientists. I'll show her how. I'm, she'll, until she catches on to this, what I'm doing, just dip it in, set it out. It's all you have to do. The kids that eat eggs for breakfast. I poured this detergent in there and dipped it in, dipped it out, dipped it in, and dipped it out. It was still eggy. That's it. I don't believe anything I hear on television no more. No, sir. No, no, no indeed. That's the reason I don't believe any man-made system can stand God's got one provided way. It isn't Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, but it's Jesus Christ, brother. That's God's provided way, and the only way that he has is in Jesus Christ, his son. And in his son, he placed his name. Is God's name is Jesus because he came in his father's name. And so that would be God's name because he was God. Now notice, when this great moving power of God comes in to a son of God, it quickens him. The spirit of life enters into him. Then what does it do? It seats him in heavenly places right now. Not they will be. We are now. Now we've already resurrected the dynamics and the mechanics has gone to work, quickened us, and we are quickened up into the presence of God where His Spirit is. And now we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Sitting in there, that great seat of, it's already fired up, been raised from the dead. We're part of it. If you're part of the bride, you are, because the bride's part of the groom, you know. So we find out that it's the same thing. And she'll do just exactly what's predicted for her to do in this day. She won't be a lady of sin, not by no means, lukewarm, but she'll be on fire for God. She'll be moving on in the Spirit of God. Now, we're looking here now to find out. Now, let us, now at this same time that it does, that this strikes us, and when we were once dead in sin and trespassing, trespasses rather, he will be quickened together unto his word. Of this age. Now, let us think about way back in the old times of somebody that was quickened by this word just before we have a prayer service for the sake. Let's take a few characters. What's your characteristic? Let's take a man here that kept all the word of God back in the Old Testament by the name of Enoch. He was so quickened by the word of God that he had a testimony that he pleased God. There wasn't one thing that God commanded Enoch to do, but what he did it. I wonder how many Enochs would be here this afternoon. That if you know it's in the Word of God, how many of you bob-haired women could call yourself an Enochus? No, God condemns that. How many of you men that let them women do that could call yourself an Enoch? Oh, my. That's just one thing. How about the thousands and we smother down and say, I belong to this and I belong to that. You may belong to that, but till you come into God's provided place, you can't get in there unless you become part of that word and being part of it. You become all of it, subject to all. Notice, we have this year that the Bible calls the word of God, in which it is the word of God. Now we find out that Enoch 
come into God's provided way with his word and walk 500 years and please him. And we find out that the mechanics were so perfect in him that when the dynamics got to working in the engine, it just took him off the earth. He took the first airplane flight like to heaven. Working on God's mechanics and dynamics together, he was not because God took him out of the earth without death. That's exactly right. He's walking in God's provided way. He's the same thing we find that on Elijah. Old Elijah had bawled out so many of those painted face Jezebels and haircuts and so forth that they were using that day. The old man had spent his life just condemning sin amongst them women because he had a woman Jezebel there that set a pace just about like your Hollywood here has and got all the sisters all wound up into it out there. And the Jezebel still is. You just look around and you can see she does. And she's still in great power, too. Now we find out the old fellow, uh, being a prophet, he'd cursed that thing and everything stayed perfectly in the will of God when all the rest of the preachers weakened off. He stayed right there with it. And one day he got so tired that God sent a chariot down from heaven and the horses of fire and took him up. He's so full of that quickening power. Just think, with the word of God in his heart, he becomes so full of that quickening power that quickened him. If the spirit of God... He, I believe we find in Romans uh, 11 or 111, if it says, if the Spirit, or Romans 8, 11 it is, if the Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead be in you, it will also quicken your mortal bodies. Yes, praise the Lord. If the Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, if, if it be in you, it will also quicken your mortal bodies. Quicken it. What does the word quick mean? The Greek word means to be brought to life after death. Hallelujah. There's a gate of worship. Worship it in the spirit and in truth. Mechanics and dynamics together. You see what I mean? If the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken, make alive your mortal bodies because it's already life. And when it comes into your body, it brings your whole body subject to it. Subject to what? The Word of God. If it's in you. Now, if it's something in you telling you, well, that was a day's past and Mark 16 is not true and that Pentecostal idea of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that ain't the Spirit of God in you. I don't care how well you're trained. You're, that's not the Spirit of God. You say, well, my mother belonged to this and my father through years and my brother... Uh, whatever you want to say about your relatives and so forth, that might have been all right with them, but it ain't for you. See? You've got to this day come into Christ Jesus for this age and the promise that's meant for this age. Notice, we find out that this great quickening power struck Enoch, it quickened him, and he went home without dying. It struck Elijah, quickened him, till he went home without dying. We find out his successor was Elijah, which is a type there of Christ in the church. Elisha, Elijah had done four miracles, and Elisha had done eight miracles. He had a double potion like was poured out upon the church. Later, they had a dead man thrown over on his bones, and he come to life. That quickening power was in the grave with him. You can't, it's always there when you get that quickening power of God being quickened up with him now. Now, remember, in Christ, we are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bones. When God wounded Christ to Calvary, he was wounded for me and you. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, body of his body, name of his name, bride of him. See, we are in him. We are his flesh and his bones. And God has already raised us up potentially. The quickening power that raised us from a life of sin and changed our being it has potentially raised us up in Christ Jesus, which the resurrection will bring us forth in the fully maturity. Now, remember, we died in our own name, was buried and raised in his. See, we're no more of our own. Of which that great name of Jesus Christ, which the Bible said over here in Ephesians 1.21, that both families in heaven and earth is named after that name. That's where God put his name. That's the family's name in heaven. That's the family's name on earth. And we're in Jesus Christ by spiritual baptism, not by water. By spirit, we are baptized into one body, which is Christ. The worshiping place, then being in there, we're being on this ground. It's like the abstract deed. You say, I bought a piece of ground. It isn't yours yet until you got an abstract. 
But you got an abstract that shows that everything was ever against that piece of ground has been stricken off. And then when you become a Christian and accept Christ as your Savior, then when God sends down the abstract, it shows that no matter what your father did, your mother did, what anybody else did, your mother, daddy might have been drunkards, prostitutes, whatever it was, every sin is stricken off. You've got an abstract tile. There's nothing can put you off of it. And look, everything that's on that ground belongs to you. Amen. And when you're in Christ Jesus by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, every gift of God belongs in the church. It's an abstract title deed. You, it's yours. It belongs to you. It quickens your mortal bodies. Oh, my, if we think of it. Let us take a look at those faithful ones at Pentecost. They were all in the upper room there, and they was uh, all scared. They had, a, they had the, the title all right, but they were afraid. And all at once there came a sound from heaven, the abstract sent down to them like a rushing mighty wind, filled all the house where they were sitting. And they were so quickened by that to all their cowardliness. They were, one of them was afraid to even deny he was the Pharisee yet. Or he wasn't a Sadducee yet. But when that Holy Ghost fell and baptized him into Jesus Christ, he became flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, word of his word. He was a new creation. He was a new person. He quickened his body. Look what it did. What it does to you when it comes in. It don't make you go around and say, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist. Oh, I know I ought to smoke, I ought to have this, I ought to wear these kind of clothes, I ought to do this, I ought to do that. It so quickens you until you have to do it. It quickens your mortal bodies. Look, it quickened their bodies until they flew so close to heaven, until it quickened their body to speak in a language they never heard of before. It quickened their bodies. They spoke in new heavenly language. They were quickened into the presence of God by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God's quickening power baptized them into that. They were in the place of worship then. They were where they could worship. The Sanhedrin or nothing else ever could bother them because they were quickened. They were new people. That's after they was baptized. Look at little Stevens. He come into God's provided way, was quickened by the power of God. Come into the gate, God's provided way. And even when they went to kill him, stoned him to death, he said, I see heavens open. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's quickening power. He's quickened up into his bosom. There was Philip, another one full of the quickening power. We find him down there at Samaria holding a great revival. This great quickening power after he was in Christ. Come where he had thousands of people listening at him. And he said, Now, ah, leave here, Philip. I want you to go out into this desert case of here. I got a man out there I want you to meet. And no question, no question at all. He is full of that quickening power. He was in Christ. He is the provided place where God could talk to him. God spoke to him. There's no question. Say, well, he spoke to him and told me I'm going to be healed, but I don't know now. I feel awful bad today. Oh, Well, he told me I had the Holy Ghost, but sometimes I sure doubt it. <laughs> Philip noted exactly the voice of God because he'd come God's provided way. He didn't question God about, well, God, I got so many here. I have to stand. I have to see the state president before I can do it. I have to go talk to the bishop. But nothing about it. He minded God. Right out into the desert he went. He found one man, a eunuch, an Ethiopian, a colored man, coming down reading the scripture in Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can it someone but teach me? Philip got up on the chariot and began to talk to him about the Lord. He said, here's water. What enters me from being baptized? He said, if thou believest with all thy heart, all thy soul and mind strength, got off the chariot and baptized him. And Philip was so full of that quickening power until he caught him out of his sight. Think, in his mortal body, his physical being was caught up out of the sight of the unit. I believe that to be the truth. God could take him somewhere else where he had need of him. He's caught up. You know, death can't even take that thing away from you when you're in Christ, in God's place. Look here, Moses had it. He's a prophet that the word of the Lord came to. No many, how many Korahs raised up and said, we need a great organization now. You try to take the place of being the only holy man. God said, separate yourself. I'll just swallow him up. And the Dathans and so forth didn't bother him. He went right on. And when Moses died and was buried by the angels... That quickening power stayed on him for 800 years later. Here he is over the promised land talking to Jesus. That quickening power was still on him. That's God's place of worship. What say? How did you know? He was a prophet. The word came to the prophet. And he was the manifested word of God for his age. Amen. 
See, you can't die. You're done quickened. Oh, if the church could only see that. But it's not what you're going to be. You already are. It's the devil trying to rob you from that. Well, say, now, I tell you, I belong to this. Don't care what you belong to. You've got to be born, regenerated, baptized with the Holy Ghost into Jesus Christ. Quickened to every word. Your spirit in you will punctuate, amen, to every word of the Bible. Praise God. Outside of that, if it shakes its head on one, you get rid of that spirit. It's not the spirit of God that would dispute the word of God. It'll keep the word of God. Not only does it believe it, but it makes it live. It manifests the word of God. Yes, sir. Notice also those saints of the Old Testament potentially are the old sacrifice. They were waiting for this new one to come, had a good conscience towards God. In Matthew 27, we're told that when Jesus raised and come out of the grave, which we just celebrated a few weeks ago, Easter, the Bible said that many of the saints that were sleeping in the dust of the earth raised up at his resurrection and come into the city and appeared to many. What were they? They were manifestations of God's promised word. The only place that God meets them under that sacrifice. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Bible said also that the New Testament saints would come forth with you when he comes again. Damn, it's quickened into him now. How do you get into him? By spiritual baptism. The power of God, the place that he meets in Jesus. Now, Jesus is God's provided way. Now, notice, Jesus was so sure... What he was. He knew he was the son of God. He knew he was virgin born. He knew that every scripture manifested itself right through him. He knew it so perfectly too. He said to them, builders of the temple that day, he said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Think of that. Destroy it and I'll raise it up in three days. Why? It was a written word of him. David said, I'll not leave my... Holy One in hell, and did not leave his soul in hell, neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. Now, Jesus knew that that was he. No question in his mind. And he knew that 72 hours the body corrupts. Sometime within that 72 hours, he is going to come back to life again. So he said, you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up again in three days. Why? The word was written of him. It was written of him because he was a manifestation of God's written word for that day. Well, there's got to be. Hallelujah. There's got to be, brother. Somewhere's God's manifested word of God today. That's the same thing. For he spoke of these days. And he said what would take place in these days. He's already told us we know what's going to take place. And we see it being manifested in you, then you're in God's church. Outside of that, you can call yourself Methodist, Baptist, or anything else. It'll never work. You was only one meeting place. That's in Christ Jesus. Oh, today. Oh, how today that I would that everybody would see that. See how to get in. Being baptized. The bride is part of her husband. The church is a part of the word. The manifestation. Now, what church are you in? Are you in a denomination? If you are, I'll strictly tell you now, you're in Lady Osea. But if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. And you're in the church of the living God with the manifestation of the very same things that he did in his day. will be coming back here in this day doing the same thing that he said it would do. And that is the real church. You get into it by spiritual baptism. Not by joining, not by some more, but by being baptized by the Holy Ghost into his body. All right, it's God's only provided way that we is left for us to do is to be baptized into his body by his spirit. Jesus said in St. John 14, 12, He that believeth while he is in me. No wonder people say the days of miracles is past. No wonder they say these things. He that believeth in me, not believe on me, but believe in me, the works that I do shall he do also. Why? It's his life. It's his dynamics in his mechanics that's in you that fires it off. Makes it go and do the works that it promised to. Or my life in him has quickened me by his spirit. 
to make his word, which is the mechanics work by his dynamics. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, also, and Mark, the 17th chapter, the 30th verse of St. Mark, listen closely. Jesus promised these things in the last days. That he's the same yesterday and forever. He promised in Malachi 4 that he would turn the hearts of the people in the last days back to the faith of the fathers. He promised that. He promised so many places in the Bible the things that he would do. Yet a little while the world seeth me no more, yet you'll see me. I'll be with you, in you, always, even to the end of the world. And notice, in St. Luke, again, 1730, as it was in the days of Sodom. You know what happened in Sodom? Look in California. Not only California, United States. Not only United States, but the world. Look at this teenage, insane, while well, we had, a, I told you the other day, they had taken analysis there of the schools in Arizona where I live. And 80% of the children in school is mentally retarded. What will their children be? We can't have another generation. We're at the end. Jesus said these things would come. Look at all the televisions and things. Get these fictitious things in order. It'll come a time, I predict, that people will be completely, totally insane. The world will be the Bible speaks of such hideous sights as it's shown movies today of some prehistoric creatures, eggs that's lived in the earth for so many thousands and millions of years, hatch and come forth to some. That's just a minor thing of what's going to happen. When hell is open and the devil comes out with all these mysterious things with women or locusts with hair like women and right. teeth like lion, while well, the world will be completely, totally insane. Right. It's not just about one degree from it now. Oh, for the glory of God, for the coming of the Lord, for the Holy Ghost, for the no-so, for the living presence of the living God. Jesus said in the St. Mark there, he said, in that day, the Son of Man will be revealed. Now remember, not Son of God. He came in three sons' names. Son of Man, Son of God, Son of David. When he was on earth, he come as son of man. He was a prophet. Son of man is a prophet. Jehovah himself called the prophets. Jeremiah and them, son of man, what seest thou? Jesus come because he had to come according to the scripture as son of man. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. And he had to be a prophet, son of man. But after his death, burial, and resurrection, now he's been son of God, the supernatural, the Holy Ghost. But he promised just before the coming of the end time, the world would get like it was at Sodom. When a man came down in human form, three of them, two angels, and God himself. That was God. The Bible said it was. Now, he came down and he manifested himself there by turning his back to the, the tent. Where Sarah was and told Abraham what Sarah was thinking in the tent. Is that right? Now, Jesus himself said, at the day when the Son of Man is being revealed. In other words, the Son of Man, the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. The church will come through justification, through Luther, through sanctification, uh, through Wesley, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the Pentecostals, and grow right on into the perfection of the Son of Man. That when husband and wife will be the same self persons. God will be so manifested into his bride, his church, that they'll both be the same. They are one. Now you see where we're at. Don't hold to them traditions and creeds. They were all right in their day. But the flowers bloom to a blossom now. It's seed time. Right. Jesus promised these things. Now, when we see God make his promise live before us and see that it's in us and his spirit is living in us, that is the only way of worship, only place of worship, the only true way you can worship. For there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. God made the promise. Jesus said, the things that I do, you'll do also. And what he would do in the last day, I'd come through this age, neither light or day would be the, the, like a darkened time, but said, the evening time, it shall be light. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. The same sun rises in the east, sets in the west. 
civilizations travel with it, it travel over three bodies of water, three forms of baptism. Oh, yes. From Asia, over into Europe, from Europe, over into England, and from England, over into the United States. And now we've come right straight back again, and here we sit this afternoon on the West Coast. Where the sin barrier of all the powers of darkness heaps in here on these movies and television casts and man kissing women on there and poisoning the minds of little girls. Did you know any man that kisses a woman is morally obligated to marry her? Potentially it's a sex act. Sure it is. Yes, sir. What is it? It's the male glands in a man's lip and the female glands. When male and female glands come together, it's sex. Look on Hollywood. Look at the little girls laying out here in the parks and the boys wallowing around over these girls and things like that. And even singing in choirs and these Elvis Presleys and so forth that we have today. It's a disgrace to the name of America, to what our forefathers fought and bled and died for. But the hours come that every kingdom has to give away because there is a kingdom of God that's established in the human heart by the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus Christ. And Christ will come to his bride and will set up a kingdom here on earth that will never be diminished. How do you get into this kingdom? You're born into it. How do you know you keep, how would you belong into a kingdom and disagree with the king? You'd be, and the king is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word is with God, and the word was God, and the word has made flesh and dwelt among us. The same yesterday, today, and forever. How do they know he was the son of man? You look out there upon the audience and perceive what they were thinking about. We know that's true. He's the same today. You believe that? Did Billy give out any prayer cards? I swear I forgot to ask him. Did he give out prayer cards? He give out prayer cards. All right. I tell you, if you got faith enough, I've got faith to believe that God, who made the promise, can prove Himself to be God right here, without any person coming to this platform. I feel to take the initiative on account of the promise of the Word of the Living God. Look at here. Let me show you something. This quickening power. We're going to exercise it. Let me show you. How many believe you got that quickening power? What's the matter with your hands upon the sick? When them disciples received quickening power upon them on the day of Pentecost, what did they do? They went out and laid hands on the sick and they recovered. Jesus said in Mark 16, it will continue on to the end of the world. How long to the apostles' age? Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. These signs will follow them that believe. If they lay their hands upon the sick, they shall recover. That's the quickening power like it was on Elijah's bones. Elisha's bones. The same quickening powers up on the saints that raised them up. That same quickening powers in us. Lay your hands on the sick. They shall recover. I've noticed you. I've almost quit having discernment anymore. Just lay my hands on the sick. I've been noticing one of my things that I never... I didn't get to one third of the people otherwise. This way I get to more than I ever did get to. And I find out a better result by just getting myself into God's arms and saying, Lord God, you promised it. It's your promise. It's not mine. It's yours. And you promised you'd do it, and I've seen you do it, and I'm going to believe you're going to do it. Because I've been baptized into your body and your spirit here to identify that that's the truth. Amen. That's the place of worship. Then you get into a place, all things are possible. Then you get into a place that your, that your motives and objectives for your achievements is just exactly in the will of God. And when you lay your hands there and believe it, it's going to happen. You believe that? I believe before one prayer card is called or anything else, that God Almighty can tell me what you got out there, and what you ought to do, and what you ought not have done. That's taking the initiative right. I know that's right, but that's exactly what God would have us to do. You believe that? How many would believe it if God would do it? There's not a person sitting in front of me that I know it I can think of or see anybody that I really know. How many knows that you're all strangers? Raise your hands. Lord, I don't know nothing about you. Raise up your hands. Anywhere in the audience knows I know nothing about you. I guess it's everywhere, especially up in here. Uh, maybe the other people just, I don't know them. They just didn't raise their hands, but I, I, I don't know them anyhow. I believe I do see Richard Blair sitting right here. I believe that's right. I can't, it's dark down there. There's lights this way. I don't see but well, look here, I'm trying to tell you that when that quickening power comes into you, it's Jesus Christ. When Jesus laid his hands on the sick, they got well. 
When Jesus had quickening power to quicken him as a man, he could look out and tell the thoughts that was up on the people. Tell them what they were thinking about, what they'd done. Have his back turned to him, tell him the same thing. What do you reason in your hearts? The woman touched his garment. He said, who touched me? He looked around and found her and said, I perceive virtues going out of me. Your faith has made you whole. That's Jesus Christ. That proves that where the church is and what the real quickening power of God does to the human being. Do you believe that? Amen. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Dear God, we've had a fight with Satan this afternoon on these microphones, knowing them people probably didn't get half of it. They're bounding around in the building like that. But I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will take that which is meant to be, Lord, to let the people see that we're not uh, some uh, dead, dragging bunch of hope souls. God, we are alive now, quickened by the power of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus Christ lives in us. We believe that, Lord. We claim no glory of our own, like on Mount Transfiguration, where every one of us is represented there. There was Moses, the one who died and raised again. There was Elijah, the quickening saints that will be caught up at the last day. Oh, they seen then, when they look back, they seen Jesus only. We know, Lord, we don't want people to see us. We're not here for that purpose. Far be it. But, Lord, it does delight our hearts when we see Jesus glorified among us. When we see him glorified. When we see his word, which he is the word. When we see, we can read it here in the Bible where he promised he would do it. Then see him work it right in us. Oh, God, how it makes us feel humble that we know that his living presence, we haven't joined nothing or bargained for nothing. We just believe, Lord, unto eternal life. And you sealed us in there by the baptism of the Holy Ghost and quickened our bodies and quickened our spirits and quickened us in to see visions and prophesy and speak in tongues, see great signs and wonders take place. Why, it's a living God. We're into that body, which to the world is foolishness. To them it perish, but to we who believe, it's a power of God unto eternal life. We thank thee for it, Father. Now, let it be known this day, Lord, that you are God, that you have never changed your mind about one word that you ever said, and you're the same yesterday and forever, and the one, uh, one and only way that God has provided, the only man that God ever put his name in was his own son who carried his name, Jesus, God, Jehovah, Savior, Emmanuel, the door to the sheepfold. He that was, which is, and shall come. The root and the offspring, both root and offspring of David. The morning star, the lily of the valley. Oh, God, how wonderful. No wonder Isaiah said, Counselor, Prince of Peace, the mighty God, everlasting Father. Oh, we have no other father but you, Lord. You are our father. You are our mother. You are all that we are, all that we could ever be. We won't see nothing else but Jesus glorified. Father, I might have made a poor out at this this afternoon, but take the sentiments of my heart and hear me, dear God, and let it be said this day that Jesus Christ was glorified right here in this temple. Grant it, Father, for we ask it in his name. And as I humbly wait with this audience to see you move by your spirit. Amen. Now, I want you to do one thing for me. I want to ask you one solemn question. I want you to answer me as if it was the last Time that you'd ever answer anybody in your life. Do you believe it's the truth? You believe there's not a church or a denomination could be recognized in the presence of God. You believe that? There's not a one. Only those that are born into Jesus Christ take on his name. That's right. You take on his name when you're born in there, not by water baptism, although you can be baptized in his name, but that don't take on his name. You take on his name by birth, not by water. You're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, you're in the fellowship, but you're baptized by the Holy Ghost into Jesus Christ. So you can be baptized a hundred times any way you want it to, the other way it make no difference. But when you're once baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ, you become a son or a daughter of God. And every word is true. And then he did that for that purpose. I said the day when God moved and struck the sun across the earth, he knew them palm trees and everything was laying down on that earth. He, they were part of the earth at that time. So were you. And when he raised up the Son of God on Easter morning and sent forth the Holy Spirit, it was to quicken also that seed of eternal life that he foreknew before the foundation of the world that would be here. He knew this microphone would act like this this evening. He knew that you had the attitudes you've got. He's infinite. You can't imagine it with your mind. You've just got to accept it. 
But let me say this one thing. That same God stands here this afternoon in his people. Whether you're a Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever you might be, don't you trust in some organization. Because they cannot be an organization. It's made up of too many different doctrines. It's made up of a bunch. You have to be an individual to God. You have to be an individual. God deals with you, not in your church. You are to live a right kind of life in your church or congregation where you're worshiping in. You should live the kind of life that you should be. But you see, they draw up creeds and so forth that you can't even enter their doors if you don't believe that. So how can God ever come in there when his word constantly is being manifested? How did Luther know about these baptisms and restoration of the spirit when he was back in that days? The plant hadn't grown like that. Neither did Wesley know it. And neither does the Pentecostal know what's going on today. Same thing grows right away from you. That's right. It has in every age, and it always will. I can prove by the Bible this is a wheat age. Remember, after this great revival, there's never been another organization rise since Pentecost. They can't be. It goes from the shuck to the wheat, and there's nothing else but the grain. That's the reason. Fifteen years, usually three years, and they've got an organization of any revival. Ask any historian. But there's no organization after this. They try to raise up a latter-day rain, but you see what happened to it. It can't. It's wheat now. Yes, sir. There's no more carriers. It's the real grain. Christ is among these people. You believe it? Amen. Let's start from over here on the bottom floor. I can't pick out in there, seeing you so many of you. How many believe me to be his servant? Have faith in God. How many over here believe that the same way? So I believe it with all my heart. I may the Lord God grant this to us, that you might see the quickening power. It's something, vital evidence. It proves it. If somebody can say, well, this is that, this is that, but let it act. Now, it's totally impossible for me to know anything about you. You know that. I don't know, but one person I can look at, and that's Reverend Blair sitting out there from way back east, I believe Arkansas or somewhere back in there. That's the only one in the audience that I do see that I know. God knows that's true. So it'll have to be something that I just happen to see over here. This little lady sitting at the end there has got a spiritual problem you're praying about. You believe that God will straighten out that spiritual problem for you? Make it right? All right, you can have it. Put your hand over on the other lady sitting to you because she's got stomach trouble she's praying for too. Yeah, that right, sister? Raise your hands up if that's true. I don't know. You've never seen you in my life. Two colored girls. Huh? What's that? Isn't that just exactly like what he said he would do? Just exactly. Here's a lady saying, looking right down through your set, looking at me. She's got heart trouble. You believe that God will heal the heart trouble? You're sitting there praying. I wish I could get there. Is that right? Wave your hand like this. That's right. How do I know what you were saying in your prayer? Just believe. That's all you have to do is believe. Here sits a lady right here. It'll die right away if she isn't healed. She's got cancer. You believe that God will heal the cancer? Yes. You believe it? You, me and she was kind of slow putting up your hands. You believe God can tell me who you are? Miss Gunn. Now, that's right. Wave your hand like that. Uh, go home, Jesus Christ, and make you well. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. That struck this lady sitting here with a dark hat on looking at me. She also has cancer. You believe God will heal you? You believe it with all your heart? I'm speaking to Mrs. Miller. <laughs> you believe that? I don't know the woman ever seen her in my life, and God in heaven knows that's right. Amen. If thou canst believe. Here's a colored woman sitting right over here in the end. Had her head down. She was studying. She's studying about a loved one. Somebody is, she's praying for. She come actually to pray, have him prayed for. No, he isn't here. It's her husband. That's right. She, he's not here. He's at home. He's had an operation, hasn't he? That's right. He's bothered with sinus trouble and so forth. That's true, isn't it? He's going to be all right. Your faith is strong, Lord. You believe that that's to be true? Amen. Can't you see that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Ask those people. It's when come across the audience. You believe it, he's here? Do you feel that quickening power in you? Well, that's a God that makes you well, friends. You believe it? Now, would you do one thing for me? For the, How many in here are sick? Let's see you raise your hand. Now, it's five, going on 5 o'clock. Lay your hands over on each other, and let's just, don't say a word now. Just lay your hands on one, one another. I want you to do something. Say, the man sitting right back here has got that 
growth on his back. Do you believe that God will take that growth off your back, sir? You believe that God will make you well? Young fellow, look at me. He thought he was going to get passed by. Raise your hand up, sir. That's right. You believe with all your heart, God will take it off for you. Hallelujah. I challenge this whole audience in the name of Jesus Christ. If you could, if your conscience, don't let it be stirred with unbelief. Don't let it be frustrated. Can't you see the Son of Man? The Son of Man in the form of prophetic message, returning back again in his church and prophecy, revealing Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's never been done through the age till this time. There's the proof of it. What is the church? How do you get into it? When you're in there, everything that Jesus Christ was, you are. Even to be a son and daughter of God. He become you that you might become him. The thing of it is, you're scared to use it. Or either you're not cooperating with his word. Now that won't do a bit of good. I don't care what you do. If you don't come fully into that word, it'll never work. Who can accuse me of something he said and promised in this day that didn't happen? Then don't throw your denomination at me. Because it won't work. Hallelujah. I feel, I know he's here. I'm positive he's here. I know that now there's quickening power enough in the church to heal every person that's sitting here. Can you believe it? Well then, would you, do you believe in praying for the sick? Do you believe Jesus said they lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? All right, put your hands over on each other now. Don't pray for yourself. Pray for the next person they're praying for you. Uh, quietly, reverently. Lord, how I thank you. I can stand here at this platform and, and preach a word that's so contrary to the people thinking today that they call it heresy. They call it spiritualism. They call it evil spirits like they did when Beelzebub. But to see you right in the midst of this grand audience this afternoon, turn right around and confirm and prove exactly what's been preached, that it is the truth. God, these are your people. The, the, the devil has tried to mess up the microphones. He's tried to mess up the people's thoughts. He's tried to keep them from getting this. But I believe they'll get it anyhow, Lord. I ask for them to get it. I ask for them to receive it. Grant, Lord, these believers with quickening power that when they, if they don't live to see your coming, that quickening power will raise them up at the last age. Grant just now that that quickening power will quicken their faith, Lord, to what they're doing. There's a believer got a hands on a believer, a body to a body, a power to a power. And it's a power of God by a son of God or a daughter of God by the son of God. Oh, God, may Satan turn this people loose. May they be healed this afternoon by the resurrecting, quickening power of the presence identified Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, may it be so. Your hands on the people has got quickening power in them. If you've been quickened, have you come to life? Has Christ become real to you? Has the power of God been manifested? Are you in that church, God's provided church? How are you in it? How do you know you've been quickened in it? Your whole thoughts, your whole being is in Christ now. And Christ is in the midst of the people, proving himself alive, proving that he's here at the days of Sodom. With them hands of those people that their lives have been changed from streetwalkers, from drunkards, from prostitutes on the street to genuine saints of God. Quicken their hands is laying upon you. They're in the church by Holy Ghost baptism. The same power is upon Elijah's bones. That same power is laying upon your shoulder, upon your hands, upon your heads. That same quickening power with him standing here proving that he's alive from the dead. Amen. Can you believe him now? Can you believe that hands laid upon your godly hands? Can you believe that spirit that's quickening us now? Making us that crazy to the world. Do you believe that's his quickening power? 
Do you believe you're in his church? Then if you are and believe in those hands that are laying on you are holy hands commanded by God, then I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to stand to your feet and accept your healing. Everybody that's been saved. Christian, you realize what's taking place? Do you realize out in that street corner is millions of people walking these streets today that's nothing in the world but atomic power? Do you realize that people are dead in sin and trespassing tonight? The black of churches all over for a few little lectures or something on some kind of a keeping of a certain thing and call it religion? Did you realize that you have been raised from death unto life and has been baptized into the body of the living God that's quickened your bodies before we speak in tongues and interpreting tongues, seeing Jesus Christ manifested among us? What sickness could not stand in such a group as this? Let your faith go to him. Believe him. Say, Lord God, I believe with all my heart. And you will be made well. Is there sinners here that would like to come into that body? Raise your hands and say, I have never come into it. I've never been filled with the Holy Ghost. But Brother Branham, I certainly desire it this afternoon. Will you pray for me? Raise your hands. Don't be ashamed you're in His presence. Just look at the hands. Look at the hands. Now everybody that wants the baptism of the Holy Ghost, raise up your hands. Wherever you are. Now you that's got the Holy Ghost is standing there, lay your holy, consecrated hands up on them. If the Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it quickens your mortal bodies from death to life. It brings the whole body into the subjection to the Spirit. Now, let's bow our heads and everyone pray for those people who want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I do believe that God will fill each one of you right now with the Holy Ghost. Why don't we wait, friends? You're going to wait too long one of these days. This is the hour. Don't wait any longer. You're right here in this temple where you got all night to stay and pray. Dear God, I pray that you'll send the Holy Ghost again, like as a Russian mighty wind, fill all the house after a perfect identity.